Looks like some good stuff coming up there. I had somebody um, come up to me this morning. Mike came up to me, and he showed me the shooting day in the bulletin. And he's like, I love my pastor. <laughs> yeah, we like, we like to shoot guns around here. And I know I'm not alone. I saw during prayer, I think I saw a Second Amendment shirt there in, uh, on Dave. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're a fan of it. And um, you'll, you'll hear more about that next week. I think John is going to come up and share with us. John is going to come up and share with us next week some more about that. So it's fun, good time of connection, good time of making loud noises and blowing stuff up and <laughs> looking down scopes. And we like all those kinds of things around here. So um, also I want to remind you too that um, on your benches there, you'll see these things called good reports. And what those are is those are an opportunity for you just to write a testimony on those. Um, something about, you know, what has God done for you? You know, we like to pray for people in this church, but we also like to hear how God is answering those prayers. So if you have something that you want to write down on those and turn it in afterwards at the hub or drop it in the offering box, however you want to do it, um, we'll collect all those and put them together, and then we'll read them next week in church. So um, if you have a good testimony, make sure to write it down for us today so that we can rejoice in the Lord with you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Wow, I was thinking today, I remember 21 years ago, I was, um, I was in a machine shop working early in the morning, and um, just kind of a normal day, kind of a quiet day in the machine shop. And the secretary walked out there into the shop, kind of, you know, um, shaken up a little bit. And she said, she said, they're flying planes into the World Trade Centers. And, um, and at the time, I don't know if you remember this back then, probably a lot of you will, but somebody had just flown an airplane not too long before that, into the White House. Do you remember that? But it was like a Cessna, like a little airplane, like a little single prop airplane, and somebody flew it into the White House. So when she came out into the, into the shop and she said, somebody's flying planes into the World Trade Center, in my mind, I thought like little Cessna airplanes, you know, the little single prop kind of airplanes flying into them, and then so we kept working. We were like, oh, wow, you know, we kept working. And a little while later, she came out and she said, one of them fell down. And that's, you know, when we knew, okay, something serious is happening. So that was 21 years ago today. Yeah, it's, it's hard to believe. I said that in the foyer earlier, and Diana was like, that's got to be wrong. It can't be 21 years ago. It was 21 years ago that that took place. And we, we like to remember those things that happened to our nation. If you didn't know it around here, we love the United States. We like to have a flag in our sanctuary. We have a flag in our foyer today. My family and I, we tried to wear something that was a little bit patriotic in some way because we love the United States of America. And we pray for our nation. And we remember the 3,000 people who lost their lives on that day. And that was, a, that was a significant tragedy in American history. And we saw, as Americans do, how our nation just pulled together during that time. I'll never forget George Bush standing there on ground zero. And somebody started shouting to him. And he said, he said I hear you. And he said, and our enemies are going to hear you too, right? And I was like, oh, good. Somebody's going to do something about this. But I remember our country um, binding together during that time. So I just wanted to share that. I'm sure that all of you have some kind of memory about what was happening on that day, unless you're too young to, to remember that. But, um, but a lot of us do remember it. And it was, it was a stunning time in American history, for sure. So um, there's a lot of historical stuff been happening lately. This last week, the Queen of England passed away. And that was also pretty significant. 70 years she was the queen. You, you think about how many things she saw over that period of time and just all the changes in the world that happened while she was the queen. And one that was even 
maybe because it's, it's something that was more significant in my mind growing up, but somebody else passed away recently, and that was um, Mikhail Gorbachev just passed away in the last couple of weeks. And I don't know if any of you are, um, I'm sure you are, but I don't know how many of you were thinking about that when that happened, but just remembering the significance of that time in history as, um, as he was the head of the Soviet Union and our president at the time, Ronald Reagan, were having tremendous summits about, about um, the kind of dismantling of the Soviet Union during that time. And those were significant things in history. I, Ronald Reagan is the first president that I can remember. I was born in 1975, so I have very few memories of the 70s, but the 80s, the 80s were my jam. I love, I love the 80s, you know? I love the movies, I love Top Gun, I loved break dancing. You had movies like Breakin', Breakin' 2, Electric Boogaloo, right? Those were the good times. Ghetto Blasters, piece of cardboard on the ground, doing a little, doing a little dancing, right? So anyways, um, Ronald Reagan is the first president that I remember. In fact, I remember when I first realized that he could not be president again. That, you know, he was, his second term was done, and that was when I was introduced to that, that reality of our government, that, oh, this is it. And I don't know if it's because he was so revered in our family or not, and I did follow those things. Even when I was a kid, I watched the world news every night. But remembering, oh, my goodness, he can't be president again. What are we going to do, you know? And um, I loved him so much. I remember, like, even during those times when he was having the summits with Mikhail Gorbachev, I don't know if you remember, but towards the end of Ronald Reagan's second term, they started being concerned that he might have a little bit of cognitive decline. Yeah, remember that? A little bit of cognitive decline that was happening during that time. God forbid we ever have a president again who's dealing with some cognitive decline. But um, I remember he was dealing with that at the time, and there was this big concern when he was going to meet with Gorbachev that, oh my goodness, this, this guy who's so sharp and so amazing is just going to own him. And they had that footage of when him and Gorbachev met at that house to have that summit, and uh, Ronald Reagan walked up to him, and he stood about a foot taller than him, and he just kind of grabbed his hand, pulled him to him, and then guided him into the house. And it's like, oh, he's got this, right? And it was shortly after that that Ronald Reagan came out with that speech where in it he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. Talking about the Berlin Wall that was still there as a separation. And as I was thinking about all those things in history and as we're going into Acts chapter 15, I was thinking about Jesus because Jesus was and is the ultimate wall demolisher. Amen? He is our peace, and he has broken down every wall of separation. And we're going to see that today as we look at Acts chapter 15. Now, this sermon is going to feel like one of those sermons that... Like, as we're in it, you might start thinking, like, oh, this is going to be a long sermon. But it's not. This is going to be a sermon like, like, think of it like an aircraft carrier landing. Top gun, right? Like, it's okay, we're coming in for a landing, and then, but as soon as we touch the, the deck of the ship, it's going to be like, boom, right? We're going to be done. So, so if you start to think, oh, my goodness, you know, I'm so starving, and the, the food for the potluck is going to get cold and it's not going to work. No, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. We're going to be done in plenty of time for that. So um, Acts is at its heart a historical book in that it records for us the birth and history of the early church. And we see the church start in Jerusalem, but the gospel can't be contained by a city. And we see, the, we see the gospel first spread to the Jews, but the gospel can't be 
contained by one ethnicity or one religious group or one, it had to spread past that to the Gentiles. And as the gospel is beginning to spread rapidly, we also get a look in the book of Acts at the growing tension that was in the Jewish community about the grafting into God's family of the Gentiles. So let's take a moment and just kind of get a Jewish perspective on this as we're going into it, because if you are a Messianic Jew at this point, and by that I mean a Jewish person who has accepted Christ as your Savior, if you are a Messianic Jew at this point, you have spent your life rightfully observing the ordinances of God, such as circumcision, Sabbath days, diet restrictions, prayer customs, the list goes on. And these were all things that the Jews had been observing, and rightfully so. These were the commands of God to them. And now they've come to a place, as they've been waiting for the Messiah, that they believe Jesus is the Messiah, and he has come again. So they've accepted the Lord, and they joyfully receive him as their Savior. So imagine their mindset, though, because there was no handbook at this point to instruct them how to proceed forward then as a Christian. There wasn't something that was issued to them at that point saying that you don't need to practice circumcision anymore to be right with God or go ahead and go to work on Saturday this week and, and take a pulled pork sandwich for your lunch. or You know, they didn't get any manual that suddenly lifted all of these restrictions off of them. So it's easy for us as we study the New Testament to kind of demonize these people that we identify as Judaizers. Judaizers were people who were coming into the early church, Jewish people coming into the early church and saying, yes, we recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, but you still have to be circumcised to be saved. Or, you know, you still can't eat pork or you still can't, you know, you still have to observe the Sabbath. So we call them Judaizers because they were trying to um, re-implement Jewish law into the church even into the Gentile church. So, you know, looking back on it and having the full canon of scripture like we do, we can go, oh my goodness, you are taken away from the grace of God. You don't need these works to be saved. And, you know, all of this stuff in hindsight is very obvious for us. But for them in that time, not having the book of Galatians yet, not having the book of Colossians, not having the written down teaching of the apostles to the church assembled for them to read, they did not know. So we look back on them and even the term itself, Judaizers, it almost sounds like a villainous term, like they were Judaizers. But there is a little bit of grace that we could have for them because they didn't know. Now, at some point, they did know they were taught it, and then there was, you know, maybe more, of a, maybe more of a thing where they could say, you were rebelling against the will of God. But at this point, they did not know what was going on. Acts chapter 15 introduces us to something called the Jerusalem Council. And the Jerusalem Council is where the apostles would meet to go ahead and rule and judge on matters such as this. So many Gentiles at this point are coming to Jesus, and then there are Jewish believers coming along after them into those places and going like, that's great, but now Gentiles, you have to be circumcised if you want to be right with the Lord. And like I said, I can kind of understand where they were coming from because that had not been established for them yet what they should think about that. Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council is where that gets established. Are you with me so far? This to me is an excellent example of what Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 16, when he says, um, he says, whom do men say that I am? And some say John, some say this. And he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And what does Jesus say? 
he responds to him, and I also say that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 is this um, instruction from Jesus being carried out in the church. They are going to meet James and Peter and John and Paul and Barnabas. They're all going to meet and they're going to make a decision on this matter. And hopefully what ends up happening, and it is what ended up happening, is that the council is going to make an authoritative judgment and the authority of that will be congruent to and recognized by heaven. Does that make sense? So there's some great significance to what happens here in Acts 15 as the gospel is going into the Gentiles and now the church, the early church leadership, this council is trying to figure out, well, what do we do about that? What is the defense of this? How do we, how do we know that this is even okay that the gospel is going to the Gentiles? So we've read some experiences about it so far in the book of Acts and those experiences begin to be offered as evidence. The first defense of the Gentiles comes from Peter. Peter is the first to legitimize salvation for the Gentiles, offering the proof that he saw with the Holy Spirit baptism that took place in Acts chapter 10 in the house of Cornelius. Peter shares with them, and we don't need to recap it because we took a couple weeks on this, as we have been teaching through the book of Acts, but Peter shared with them the vision that he saw and the sheep being lowered down and what the Lord said to him and then going and preaching the gospel to this Gentile named Cornelius and him and his whole household being saved and not only being saved, but being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And Peter says, when that happened, when I saw that happen in his household, it looked like it it looked exactly like it did for us when it happened to us in Acts chapter 2 back in Jerusalem. So he says that is good evidence that God is reaching out to the Gentiles through us. And then after Peter offers his argument, the next one to step up is Paul and Barnabas. Now, Paul and Barnabas had just completed their missions journey that we've been studying the last couple weeks in Acts chapter 13 and 14. And they come and say, not only did the Gentiles receive Christ with great joy, but that that preaching of the gospel and salvation, it was accompanied by a bunch of signs and wonders. They said, we saw God doing miracles as this was taking place. So that again, is evidence that God approves of what's going on. Now, the next person that steps up is James. And this is James who is the brother of Jesus. This is James who gave us the book of James. And he is the leader in the church at that time. And he comes forward with a very profound and prophetic application from the Old Testament. So what James is about to give us here, and we'll read it in Acts chapter 15, is another one of those this is that type moments. Like in Acts chapter 2 verse 4, the Holy Spirit is poured out and they begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. And then everybody's hearing them glorify God in their own language and Peter steps up and he says, hey, these people aren't drunk as you suppose. He said, this is that which was prophesied by Joel. And then he connects what they were seeing at that time as the fulfillment of that prophecy. This is that. And everybody goes, oh, that makes sense. James is about to make another connection to Old Testament prophecy. And this is one of those moments, a this is that type moment in God's word. You know, just as a little side thing, because we talk about it a lot, is when is Jesus coming again? It looks like Jesus could come again any time. Yes, he could. Jesus could come again at any time. And sometimes as we're going through 
the book of Revelation, there is such deep and intense imagery as you're going through, especially once you get past chapter four, and we try to speculate, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? And we can speculate, and what nation is that talking about? Is this talking about the European Union, or was it talking about NATO, and you know, what's the mark of the beast going to be? We can, we can speculate all we want about those things, but remember, part of the function of prophecy is that when it happens, when the actual event happens, you can look at that prophetic word and go, oh, this is that. And I think there's a lot of things that will still have that effect as we get into the last days in Revelation where we'll be able to look into God's word and say, oh, this is that. What, what is happening here? Oh, this is what Revelation was talking about. You understand? So James is about to give us one of those this is that type moments. So far, Peter has offered the evidence of the vision and outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Paul and Barnabas have offered the evidence of signs and wonders. And James will now offer the agreement and confirmation from the word of God that, yes, the gospel is intended to be going out to the Gentiles exactly the way that, that it is. So in Acts chapter 15, verse 13, it says, And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them people for his name. And with, <clears throat> and with this, the words of the prophets agree just as it is written. Now, he's about to quote from Amos chapter 9 here. In Acts 15, verse 16, he says, After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all of these things. Known to God, now that's the end of the quote of Acts chapter 9. Now we finish in verse 18, what James states to the church. He says, known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. Now, in this prophetic word, James' point in saying, do not trouble the Gentiles with our laws. Do not trouble them with things about circumcision. Don't trouble them about the meats they're going to eat. Don't trouble the Gentiles with these things. He says this because the rebuilding of David's tabernacle that was prophesied about in Amos chapter 9, he says, this is the fulfillment. This is that which was talked about in Amos chapter 9. So what is David's tabernacle, and why is it so significant to the church? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> to answer this question, I want to begin by retracing the path of the Ark of the Covenant from the time of Eli to David's tabernacle. I should have a little map up here. Yeah. Okay, so starting out at Shiloh there, up at the top, this is where the tabernacle was during the days of the prophet Eli. And just for a little reference to, this is where Samuel was when he was a child, right? And he would hear the Lord speak to him in the tabernacle, and then he would run to Eli, and Eli would say, I didn't say anything, right? This is all during that time there in Shiloh. There was a battle against the Philistines at Aphek, and Eli's sons, what were they, Hophni and Phinehas or whatever? I should have read it beforehand, but anyways... There was a battle at Aphek, and um, Eli's sons decided to take the Ark of the Covenant into that battle, right, to, so that God would give them the favor and the victory <clears throat> in that battle at Aphek. It did not work. The Philistines killed them and took the Ark. 
And then when they came back and reported that to Eli, they said, your sons have been killed. And when they said, the ark has been captured, what happened to Eli? When he heard that the ark had been taken, he fell off of his chair backwards and broke his neck. And that was the end of Eli's story. So the ark was taken by the Philistines at Aphek, and they took it to Ashdod and put it into the temple of their god, Dagon, right? And that was the story, maybe you remember it, where, you know, they've put this, they put the Ark of the Covenant in the temple, Dagon, and when they would come in in the mornings, the statue, this idol of Dagon, would be fallen over on its face, right, before the Lord, and they would stand it back up, and they would come back in the next day, and it's fallen over on its face before the ark again. And finally, um, when it fell over, its arms and its legs broke off, right? So God is saying, look, <laughs> you're not going to place me before this idol. This idol will be bowed down before me. My grandpa, about that story right there before he passed away, he told me, remember this, Chris, I'd always rather serve a God who can pick me up off of my face, not a God who I have to pick up off of his, right? And that's what idolatry is. You're not serving a God that can pick you up. You're serving a God that you have to pick up. So finally, you know, at Ashdod, they say, we don't want this thing here anymore. So they send the ark on down to Gath, and then at Gath, um, Everybody at Gath, I think, starts getting like boils and tumors, and they're like, well, we don't want it here anymore, and they send it to Ekron, and the results for them are no better. So finally, they say, you know what we'll do is we'll just slap this thing on a cart with some oxen, and we'll just, you know, slap the oxen and see which way it goes, and the ark ends up landing at this place, Beth Shemesh, which was under the control of the Israelites. And, you know, so the ark now is back in Israeli-controlled territory. Unfortunately, the men at Beth Shemesh decided to look inside the ark. And because of that, because they, they violated God's commandment in that way, the Lord killed 54,000 of them in Beth Shemesh. So then they're like... <laughs> Take it. <laughs> we don't want it either. So then it lands in Kiriath Jerem, and there it stays until David decides to bring it back to Jerusalem. Now, when David decides to bring it back to Jerusalem, he also had a rough start to this. It was a good desire of his to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. But what's he end up doing? He ends up putting it on a cart, right? And it's pulled by an ox. And as the ox is as the ox is kind of going along, the ark does this on the cart, and the guy reaches out his hand to steady it, and he dies, right, for touching the ark. And now David's upset by this. He's bitter at the Lord. They stop at this place, but the ark was never meant to be transported that way. It was supposed to be carried by the priest on staves, right? So this is another good lesson, just a little extra lesson here as we go through this. It matters how you get there. His desire to bring the ark back was good. But just because you have a good desire, that doesn't mean that it doesn't matter how you get there. David had a good desire, but he tried to go about it the wrong way, and it cost a man his life, right? So the ends do not justify the means. It does not. It matters how you get there. But finally, they figure out the right way to do it, and David gets the ark carried all the way back to Jerusalem, they're dancing, they're shouting, they're rejoicing, and he builds this tent, this tabernacle, to temporarily place the ark in, and this is known as David's tabernacle. And what David does is all that's in this place is like the ark. It's just a tent over the top of the ark. And David appoints people to worship before it like 24 hours a day. There's just a rotation of people going in there and worshiping, and people could go in there and make an offering and just worship before, this, before the ark. Now, this was supposed to be a temporary thing. And after this, David goes, I desire to make a house for the Lord, and he's going to build a temple. You're familiar with the story, right? And Nathan says to him, hey, whatever's in your heart to do, do it. 
But then God speaks to Nathan and he says, no, David is a man who has blood on his hands. It will actually be his son who ends up building the temple. So it was Solomon who ended up building the temple, right? Now here's the thing. For 40 years, the ark stayed inside of that tabernacle of David with people just coming in and out worshiping before it. 40 years. And I want you to think about the significance of that. Because as the ark is traveling during the Old Testament before that, like in Moses' tabernacle, think about the configuration that existed at that point. Um, let's go to Moses' tabernacle. Yeah, look, there's an outer court that you had to have a special privilege to enter into. Then you would go to the brazen altar and sacrifice. Then you would go to the laver, which was like this giant wash basin, and you would wash, and the inside of the bowl was super polished so that you could inspect yourself too and make sure that everything's right, everything's clean, everything's perfect. And then you would go past the laver to the table of showbread and, and you had the lampstands representing the, the Holy Spirit. And then you would go to the table of incense and make an offering. And then you would finally go through the veil into the Holy of Holies where the ark was. That's the, that's the history of the Ark of the Covenant and being able to approach it. Now, look at David's tabernacle. <laughs> you just walk straight in, and there you are at the Ark. There's not even an outer court. There is like nothing in between them and standing in front of the very presence of God. The mercy seat was the top of the ark. This is like where God was seated and people are able to just walk in here and worship before the Lord. Do you understand how significant it is? Because even after this, you know, Solomon rebuilt the temple, which was really just a hard physical building and grand, more, more elaborate and ornate than anything that had been seen at that time but it basically had all of the same elements as Moses' tabernacle. It's an outer court. It's the, it's the altar. It's the bronze laver. It's all those things, right? And it was, it was God's will, too. I mean, it was serious business to go into the Holy of Holies. Remember the story about the priest, how they would have bells around the bottom of their robe, and they would tie a rope around their ankle as they entered into the Holy of Holies. Why? Because they, had they gotten one thing wrong in the process of entering into the Holy of Holies, God would have struck them dead. And when people outside the veil would hear the bells stop ringing, they would just pull them out by their ankle. They couldn't even go in there to retrieve them. That is the status, that is the location of the Ark of the Covenant before and after David's tabernacle. But for 40 years, people could go in and just worship before it. You know that scripture where David talks about, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. Look at, the, look at how the, the schematic, no, the, where you were at, look at how the, right there, look at how the schematic was of David's tabernacle. All you had was a couple of doorkeepers. It's like, yeah, as a doorkeeper, you're just standing there in the very presence of God all day long. You're in this place of worship. You're in, you're right there in the Holy of Holies. Now, what Amos prophesied is he said, David's tabernacle will be at some point rebuilt, and then everybody's going to be able to, right? That's why it's significant. It's so significant to us, the church. James's message is the same at the Jerusalem Council. Jesus removed every veil. What was the end of the video announcements? I'm just kidding you. Okay, so... Um, just a joke. I love cell phones. Jesus removed 
every veil and obstacle that would keep a person from entering into the very presence of God. So, and I'm paraphrasing this, but this is kind of what James is saying to the church at that time. Why would we insist on ceremonial walls regarding food, circumcision, and Sabbath days? Jesus destroyed all those walls. And what the Gentile church knew and what the Jerusalem church was learning was now there's nothing in between us and the Father. There is no veil. There is no custom. There is no ceremonial law. There is no anything. All of us can come boldly before the Lord, just as they did during that 40-year period of David's tabernacle. It's pretty cool, huh? It's good news for us. Jesus is the demolisher of walls. He has demolished socioeconomic walls, race walls, and regional walls. You know, read the letters to the churches, and you'll see that the, the makeup of the church, the makeup of the early church was super diverse. And that's why in Paul's letters, he would write things to slaves and masters and how they should be connecting with each other in the church. And I know that's hard for us to get our heads around because we have, we have our more modern idea of what slavery is, and it was nothing like that back in those biblical days. It was, like a, it was more of a form of working off debt back in those times. But there still was this hierarchy in place, and yet in the church, none of that existed. None of that. Jesus had broken down all those walls. But most importantly, he destroyed the walls between us and God. The Gentile Christians were in some ways, early on in the church, they were in some ways more advanced than, than James and Peter and the others at this time because they didn't even know those walls should exist. They were just coming to the Lord. And there was a learning process for the leadership in the early church at that time going like, okay, what do we do with this? Do these walls still exist or do they not exist? Do these rules exist? Do they not exist? But I love the heart of the Gentile church early back then because they just came to Jesus. I think that's what God wants for all of us. It's amazing when you see the plans of God develop and be fulfilled over thousands of years. So what I say is let's rejoice today because he did that with us in mind. He was thinking about you when he tore down those walls. It was for the joy that was set before him that Jesus endured the cross. Amen? Amen. And he was thinking of you, Dennis. He was thinking of you, Sandy, and he was thinking of you, Victor. He was thinking of all of us, right? We were on his mind. Amen? We're done. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that you sent your son, Jesus. We are so thankful that we see all of this stuff just uh, shadowed in the Old Testament that would ultimately be fulfilled by your son. And we thank you, Lord, that we're living in this time, in this time, Lord, where we just get to come before you in your presence. God, we probably, um, we probably are are not good enough, technically, Lord, but you were the sacrifice for us, Jesus. We probably haven't done everything perfect. There's probably some part of us that needs to be cleansed, but Jesus, we are washed in your blood. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that even this morning as we were in worship and I could sense your presence in this place, God, that was made possible by what you did, Jesus. And I love how James just 
was led by the Holy Spirit to point back to that in Amos chapter 9 and say, this is the time we're living in right now. This is that time of David's tabernacle where you don't have to go through all these things and there isn't a veil. We just come right into your presence, God. So amazing, Lord. So we thank you for this, Jesus. We thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for this time that we can be together and connect as a church family today, for a time that we're going to have at this potluck, Lord. We pray, God, that you would bless this food and our fellowship, Lord. And, um, well, God, we just can't thank you enough for everything you're doing on our behalf and who you are to us. And we love you so much, Lord. Be with us, I pray, God, as we, as we go throughout our day and week and, and just... We're trusting that we have steps that are ordered of you. We thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Stick around. Have some potluck. If you forgot to bring something, it doesn't matter. There's plenty of food back there. And, um, you know, hang out, fellowship. Right? That's what it's all about. Bless you, church. Amen.